can't get unlimited unemployment. You got to start paying your student loans in September, from my understanding. And, and uh, yeah, you're, you got to pay your rent. rent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. What a crazy <laughs> concept. You know, so we have five factors there. You have to you have to pay your landlord your rent. So let's talk about the consumer for a quick second here. Is this the last hurrah summer? People, consumers are going to need to get back to work in September because it seems like the credit card debt's going up. We talked about that over the last year. And if consumers aren't spending, you know, that's going to be the driving force. And that was the goal of raising the interest rates is to maybe get consumers to have a higher car bill, a higher mortgage bill, and to get back to work. Yeah. I mean, I think that's very well summarized. I think that we um, are absorbing all the excess liquidity in the economy that would otherwise have gone into really speculative things. The extra vacation, the extra pair of shoes on StockX or whatever, the extra NFT, the extra this, the extra that, that's all out the window. A traditional home mortgage is probably doubled in terms of your monthly payments. So yeah, people will be forced to get back to work. They'll have to stay in jobs longer. They'll have to just do a much better job of managing their finances. But all of that doesn't necessarily mean that the US economy falls off a cliff. I think that the thing we have to remember is that, and I don't think we can explain it actually very well, because every time an economist has tried to do it, I don't think they've really figured this out. But we tend to have a very resilient level of consumer demand. And when you look at the correlation between consumer demand and the underlying economy, even in periods of extreme shock. So even like the pandemic is one of those moments where, yeah, the demand fell off a cliff, but that's because we were literally prevented from doing anything. We could not buy the things that we wanted to, right? Or if you even go back to 2007, 2008, in the great financial crisis, the interesting thing about consumer demand is that it snaps back very quickly. Mm. So there's this weird dynamic where folks have a base level of spending and they use a, an amount of debt to basically, you know, subsidize that. And then they're willing to work in order to make sure that that doesn't change. And I think that that's what we're getting back to. We're going to get people off the sidelines into the labor market. And yeah, I think things it's will all, keep going. Sachs, I think it's all psychology. Like if you're, I think people's spending is a function of their optimism and like maybe their last trade yeah. or their last bank statement. So it's like, oh, my NFT tripled. Therefore, it's going to triple again next month. And hey, there's a chance it might go 10x. Oh, I invested in this startup. Oh, you know, I'm getting stimmy checks. I'll get another stimmy check. And now if they get three or four moments in time where, oh, my NFT is now worth 10%. I can't defer my student loans anymore. Oh, I'm accruing interest. Oh, no. <laughs> the house I bought now has a 15% mortgage and I was on variable. So what, what's your thoughts on the psychology of the consumer here? And is everybody just still spending, but maybe downgrading a little bit? Maybe they buy the Tesla Model 3 instead of the, you know, going for the Model S. If they take business class, instead of taking business class or economy plus, they, they do a staycation and drive somewhere. I've been surprised at just how resilient the economy has been. I figured that after all the distortions we had in the economy, all the stimulus during COVID, we basically floored the accelerator and then slammed on the brakes with this incredibly rapid rate tightening cycle. I thought for sure that was going to basically crash the economy. I was in the Druckenmiller camp on this. But I think, again, what you're seeing over the last few weeks is just more and more evidence that it could be a soft landing, that we may not have a recession and we might even get rate cuts next year. But I do think that right now the risks are probably as balanced as they've been. So if you want to pull up, Nick, can you pull up that chart, the quadrants from the KOTU summit? I thought this was actually a pretty interesting chart that we saw at the KOTU summit as a useful framework for thinking about the scenarios for the economy. Sportscasted so in other words, for the audience listening. Yeah. yeah. So basically, it's a two by two quadrant where on one axis, you've got inflation and inflation can be either low or high based on 3% being the dividing line. And then the economy can be either weak or strong with 4.5% unemployment being the dividing line. So if you believe that inflation's coming down below 3% and unemployment's going to stay below 4.5%, I think it's already at like 3.5% right now, then you're back in the sustained growth quadrant, in which case the S&P 500 is going to keep ripping. On the other hand, if inflation is above 3% with low unemployment, you're back in the overheating 
quadrant, which is probably bad for stocks. Now, you could have a situation in which inflation goes down and remains good, but unemployment goes way up, in which case that'd be the hard landing. And then the final quadrant is stagflation, where you've got high inflation and high unemployment. So I think the quadrants right now are probably as balanced as they've been in quite some time in terms of where we could end up in, let's say, a year. Yeah, I think that Fraber, there are some, think? Yeah, there, there's some early signals that you can look to to get a sense of where this may be going. Disney World is empty. The lines are really short. I don't know if you guys have any friends that have been to Disney World lately or Disneyland. It was in the Wall Street Journal. The traffic has fallen off a cliff. Yeah, and there's just... There's, Another there's go woke, go broke company. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really interesting point is, do you think that the Disney traffic has gone down because the conservative half of the country basically feels yes. offended and they're yeah, maybe right. a la Bud Light? Yes. Or is it yes. a larger consumer spending yes. problem? Everybody everywhere else is still spending. Like, even if you go to like, look at the World Series of Poker main event t- this year had the historic number of entries, everything is telling you that people are getting their last hurrah. So the fact that Disney has been decaying for the past year is more emblematic of the fact that they've gotten into this social culture war and half the population of America said, we're not going to support your business like they did to Bud Light. And I'm not adjudicating the rightness or wrongness of either Bud Light or Disney, but the answer is in the actual results. The people are not walking into the store. Just to show this while we're on Disney. So here's a Disney chart for you just to show you the uh, times at the different parks over the years. It it is in 2023, meaningfully shorter than 2022 or pre-pandemic. So I don't know if that's a function of their technology that they've been deploying or if maybe conservatives are not going. But there's also another X factor, which is the previous head of Disney who got ousted and Bob Iger's back was the guy who ran parks and he just leaned into changing the pricing and it got absurdly expensive and they got rid of like the california pass and all that stuff so i think the the, the jury's out on this one bob chapik yeah but there's a broader consumer spending question that i'm, I'm saying there, there may be some early signals most consumers rely on credit as you guys know interest rates are rising and that passes through to consumers purchasing goods but other folks look at the metric of consumer credit card balance as a percentage of savings or a percentage of earnings which is actually a little bit lower given wage growth and savings that have accumulated. Regardless, there are other signals we can look to. So if you pull up this chart, this just shows a really important uh, statistic. So 80% of new car purchases are financed, meaning you take out a loan to buy the car. 40% of used cars are financed. And interest rates on uh, car loans, as you guys can see in this chart, in just the last year or so, interest rates have spiked from under 4%, call it 3.7% to an average of 7% today. And that obviously translates into a doubling of the monthly payment needed to buy a car. And now if you go to the next image, so this is now playing through in terms of used car demand and used car prices. In the last month, it was reported by Cox Automotive that the pricing for used cars has declined by 4.2%. And so this starts to indicate that there may be a bit of a softness emerging. We could argue, yes, this is having a a positive effect on the inflationary conditions, but it may also be an indication of consumer spending and that we're starting to get to a point where credit is so expensive and consumers' ability to flex credit is being decreased. And that's starting to translate through into what everyone's been worried about, which is the recessionary or declining effect on revenue, declining effect on profit of companies that are selling goods and services. So that is obviously the challenge to Sachs's point on that two by two matrix. On it, you know, if you if you reduce cost and reduce demand too much, you, you can have a recessionary effect. And consumers are a big driver of this. And so many consumers depend on credit. It's a it's going to be a big condition to watch. 